Casa de Bon Temps Roule. Crescent City, beignets, and a whole lot of humidity at the crux of a swamp, a river, an ocean, a lake, and our hurricane prone, essentially underwater, barely landmass. New Orleans. It's a city that basically invites everything under the sun to thrive in lawlessness. No rules. The weather can change, and it does all the time. The people can change, and that's evident by all the historic influences to the area. And the music can change, and that's something I can really sink my teeth into. Nolens, baby. Maybe it's the smell of the French Quarter. Kind of reminds you of waking up in a frat house. Stale booze, fresh coffee and donuts, the stench of a winch that maybe flew too far from Bourbon Street. Maybe it's the architecture. Something colonial, yet inspired by something inviting and immersive or even the sounds of the tugboats. It's kind of like one of those unwanted alarms in the morning. Whatever it is, New Orleans is a beast unto its own. Fusing together world history with dire poverty, gambling and booze with renowned Catholicism, institutional education with downright stupidity and bass backwardsness, history with modernity, and yes, tradition with rebelliousness. But that fares well for the music scene. It's an absolute melting pot of ideas, interactions that contribute to sounds and influence into one's corner about as easily as the marshes around the city are lost to the sea. So it's no surprise that things here can be a bit of a toss-up from what to do, what to eat, what to see, and ultimately what to hear. All the senses can be a bit astounding, encumbered, and frankly alarming. So I think it's about time we do things just a little differently when reviewing these venues. So let's start it off with Mardi Gras. Fucking Fat Tuesday! Every frat boy's dream and every day after's nightmare. Serious hangovers, swear. New Orleans is known for cocktails, and this is definitely a hurricane waiting to happen. And I really hope you can appreciate that pun. Mardi Gras is the biggest thing in New Orleans. People from all over come to visit and enjoy themselves in this ultimate celebration. It's not your normal scene, but I think that's a good thing for people to get outside of their own box. It's shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder traffic on basically every street in downtown. Zydeco roots at every corner. And even if it's not your scene normally, it definitely gets you in the mood. No, you probably won't recognize any of the bands that are playing along the street, but the approach is so significantly different. It's able to influence you, give you some culture. And hell, by the end of it, you probably won't even be able to make out the street names at all, or know where you are. But that makes it an absolute treasure and definitely worth putting on the calendar. But to get more into the venue side of things, there's the Fillmore. Literally steps away from the Mississippi River. And it's just an easy stretch down the Crescent City tradition. It's huge. Offer seats to people like Lizzo, Stone Temple Pilots, Grizz, Tenacious D. This is a spectacle destination in New Orleans. Plus it's on Canal Street, which I think offers a lot of off Bourbon Street attraction. And the venue itself kind of caters to a more classy clientele. Maybe someone more stage dynamic. Chandeliers hanging above you. And that's certainly the case at the Fillmore. And it's right near the warehouse district that is quickly becoming the heartbeat of the music scene in the city. But to play along with Mardi Gras, you have to understand that there are some traditional sounds in the city. New Orleans is jazz. And I don't think you're gonna get any better experience than if you were to go to Preservation Hall. This place used to be a residence and they converted it into a music venue back in the 60s to preserve the jazz scene. Again, you probably won't recognize any of the artists playing here, but as you know with good eateries, if there's a line outside, it's probably worth the wait. And it takes like an hour to get into this place. It's right on the French corner, around Bourbon Street. It's classic. And it has legacy with roots. It's easy to find. If you're looking for the true New Orleans experience, Preservation Hall is the epitome of that experience. So I think the key to New Orleans is being able to embrace something you may not otherwise be able to enjoy in your city. I mean, they definitely don't have jazz in Utah. And they certainly don't have Zydeco in Los Angeles. It's not exactly one of those do-as-the-locals-do type places. But frankly, the tourist trap involved makes it attractive. It's a destination. And it's a great spot to check out major influences that are unlike any other city in the world. Samantha Fish is a local legend. She can absolutely smash guitar riffs. And don't even get me started on her solos. But where I think she is truly able to set herself apart, especially compared to the rest of the blues scene, is that her vocals are just wholesome. So while I could review more of her catalog, that includes tracks like Runaway or Gone for Good, or even Feeling Alright, which certainly offer some serious blues guitar in both mellow chords 
and fiery, dirty solos, I think it's in Chills and Fever that she's really able to showcase her talent. It's her ability to smooth over the blues, jazz, country singing into a genre-bending soul mash. It is absolute amazingness. And I think it's also a very simple song with kind of a swing style open, saxophone, bit of a psychedelic piano mixed in, and a downward bass progression. And yes, it does offer that simple solo guitar, but that doesn't exactly overpower the rest of the song. I think this offers more than, say, just an L. King comparison. It's transcendent. Everything happens almost all at once. And while she doesn't necessarily conform to the blues scene, she certainly offers all the good of the genre with a mix of modern and ear-catching, exceptional instrumentals and talent. So check out Chills and Fever by Samantha Fish. Parlez-vous en français? No, I failed that class, unfortunately. But there's plenty of French influence in New Orleans. And certainly there are some artists that play to that tune. People here can speak French. And that's certainly the case for a band called Sweet Crew. Now, I think there's no way you can escape New Orleans without making a reference to Zydeco or Cajun music. And they do it very well. Kind of a fiddle-heavy, deep bayou. You can almost feel the mosquitoes biting you when you're listening to them. Even the verbiage they use in the culture are very much French. And it's a band that's really making a mark within the New Orleans scene, not only for their French influence and Cajun sound, but also for their modern approach to a somewhat stagnant style genre. And the one song I really want to highlight, Parlez-nous à Bois, roughly translated to Tell Us to Drink, is a significant step to a modern backbeat. It keeps the strength of deep country, though rooted in a clearly cultural sound. There's a gang of choir vocals that complement the melody clearly, and it invites the bayou into a more modern, worldly sound. And if there can be anything truly written about the New Orleans music scene, it's that they are always being influenced in a right direction. I think the French Quarter has displayed some truly incredible local acts, but it's in the bars and small stages, especially at some of those venues I've already mentioned, that you can truly identify how cultured and progressive the sunken area can truly provide for the years. I mean, is this just a stomp? Is it just smart drums? I mean, you have to be the judge. But what happens here is an ode to community gathering and music making. Having a little hand of French. Or at least the Louisiana take on the language. Anyone that's ever met my Uncle Greg will know you can barely understand a lick of what he says in English, despite the fact that he can barely speak French. And to that degree, I think you can lose yourself in the music. Heavy, deep sound that makes you feel a part of a speakeasy or a bonfire. Maybe even a Mardi Gras celebration. This song is truly a masterful take, making waves as a blend of influences for a spicy rendition that absolutely exceeds expectations. Parlez-nous au bois by Sweet Crude. So I'm a bit embarrassed that it took me so long to find this artist. Especially considering I'm a huge fan of Jimmy Fallon, and I love when late night hosts introduce new bands. Though I will never complain about The Roots being the mainstay on that show. Tank and the Bangas were able to perform on the show, and they absolutely impressed. The New Orleans mix of a ton of different people, cultures, and sounds is evident. It's a bit of a pop rendition, soulful R&B, with serious gusto. That's very apparent in their song Smoke, Netflix, Chill. Especially considering the band has some serious force in the area with what will hopefully be national appeal. I mean, how many people can say they've played a late night show slot? Urban drum beats, unique vocals, easy chord progression, easily lightens your day. But is it great? First, it's absolutely catchy. I don't know how to describe the squeaky vocals that slide from sharp and jagged to bubbly and, can I say, nearly orgasmic? Seriously, the tone pitches in and out, and it gives the impression of sweet pleasure. But it also keeps grounded in rhythm and blues vibe. Plus, the beat is just an easy jazz sweep in easy time that doesn't dominate the track. It offers structure. So thumbs up one. And it's a playlist song for sure. Just a lot of great elements. Again, from the urban beat to the playful vocals, even to the dizzying keys. There's a lot to offer for your road trip playlist or just jamming out while cleaning the house. Again, it's not too complex. And again, the backbeat doesn't dominate the vinyl scratches. It has a lot of modern influence that makes it relevant and rewarding to each listener. And as I've already mentioned, they played a late night. And I think it's safe to say, if you've gotten one of those slots, you're doing all right. The cultural impact is evident. If only for the New Orleans scene that they clearly draw from. They invoke sounds of jazz, R&B, funk, soul, but with a subtle fix on pop. It's a fascinating example of taking multiple influences in New Orleans and slugging away to create a unique sound with clearly an allure of something that you can't really put your finger on. So three thumbs up, great song, three X's approved. New Orleans 
Orleans has a gigantic history of rock and roll. From Fats Domino in the early days, even to Mute Math pushing the early thousand sound. And a band really making a name for themselves as a bit of a hipster, nearly classic rock, yes, sometimes poppy sound, is the Generationals. Everything they've done from Put a Light On to Charlemagne is a shiny tribute to classic sound in the digital age. But the song 102010 is less about the digital production and more about the harmonic echo guitar and open chords that make for a bit of an indie alternative blend of righteous, glorious, easy listening. There's a setup, subtle, fast, choppy ticks and tacks, but where it makes a mark on the rock scene is the bass coming in with only three notes, really two with an in measure octave mix up, matching the beat and pushing the emotion of the track into a nearly psychedelic, almost nearly Americana blend of roots and effectual technique. There is a bridge somewhere in the song, but its beauty is in the tempo. It's unwavering, it keeps its chill throughout. No slaps across the face that say, what the hell was that? Or walls of sound. It's just an easy jam that layers easy guitar over a splash of bat beat production. Again, it's a classic sound in the digital age. Nothing here is too complex. 10 2010 by The Generationals. You know, it took me a long time to really appreciate lesser known R&B. I'm with y'all. I really love The Weeknd and Starboy. But there are plenty of smaller acts doing some unique stuff that still have a sexy vibe. And I think where I really enjoy the pop duo Mulherin, I hope I got their pronunciation right, is that they keep an upbeat production with a clearly sexy guitar stringing. Soulful vocals line to line. And that's certainly the case in their song All To Myself, which has this amazing tick 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 It's subtle underneath all of the heavy chop bass beats. But they also have this wall of sound that's smart for one main reason. It matches that heavy bass surrounding with a heavy transition into the strum guitar later in the song. It's like when an EDM song makes a bridge and starts out, builds the hype. Here it's used more or less as a transition from emotion to sound and ultimately into the absolute nirvana of feels. I think where this is significantly different for the scene is that it's a very low-key, soulful vibe. That isn't jazz. Typically the rap scene in New Orleans is akin to Houston, Atlanta, all out bass, production sounds, but this song is able to get past all the humidity of the South and introduce a lighthearted, dry, but straightforward vocal track with easy listening. Never mind all the distractions of the R&B scene, this is a truly pop vibe with a progressive element, and it puts New Orleans on the map for much more than just Zydeco blues, R&B, etc. I was expecting to find some great rap in New Orleans. After all, the city's known for all different types of music, and especially as a central port to the Caribbean and a destination to the Mississippi, this has a lot of influence affecting its rap scene, including heavy 808s and serious stories to tell. And I think that's what made for the serious Delta Blues Center back in the day. But it's also what makes Suicide Boys so capable of making a dirty production of clearly New Orleans influence and mass appeal. Carrollton is the epitome of getting fucked up on Bourbon Street and having some amazing dark bar secrets to unveil. The backbeat production is mysterious, the bass is general, heavy, demanding to one's ears, and the hooks are inevitably dark and demanding. They offer a wall of sound with sharp lyrics yet still laid back and telling of the rap scene. Plus the outer lute is a great cap on the song to say how ratchet Bourbon Street can get poses a lot of cultural and existential problems. I mean, after all, this is a tight space in the Crescent City, with so many cultures living in a confined area, and they make a lot of comparisons that are really quite diverse, and they relegate many aspects of drug culture and addiction, rock culture and personality, business culture and winning, to a degree of simplicity that truly attracts a listener in wide-ranging forms. Carrollton by Suicide Boys. <laughs> Wheezy baby. That's right, the man, the myth, the legend, fresh smoke, raspy throated, dreadlocked, Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. Also known as Lil Wayne. He's a national treasure. He can tour as a headliner. This summer he's going with Blink 182. And he truly makes inspirational, uplifting music. He's originally from the Holly Grove district, and he's gone on to become a flagship artist with hits like Six Foot, Seven Foot, A Millie. Yeah, that guy. But let's excuse the charisma for one moment while we analyze the song. Let the beat build. Bitch! Which, for all it's worth, a true come-up type anthem. It offers a ton of insight, but it perhaps misses the mark. It's a little different than his other tracks. A little more gospel, a little more soulful. But does that mean it sucks? First, there's a bit of a question to its catchiness. Yes, it definitely builds the beat, as the song implies. But it takes forever. 
I clocked it at about two minutes to really get into the beat. So for someone giving it a first try, it's probably like one of the J.R.R. Martin books where the action happens in the back half. But the back half is amazing. So let's give this one a half thumbs up. And I would love to see Bob Dylan sing this track. Maybe some sort of country rap mashup like Little Nas X and Billy Ray Cyrus did with Old Town Road. I've been counting dirty money since 1230. A.M. Wave them if they sure take them right back and spray him. Amen. I, that, that would be cool. That sounds interesting. But it's not really as tight. And even though my desires are quite lofty, probably not practical. So again, we'll give this one a half. But for cultural impact, I can certainly give this one a thumbs up. It's complex. It's distinct from even Carter III, the album. And maybe it's the only other track on this album, besides A Millie, which gained widespread popularity. So it's only got two splits. That equals one thumbs down, maybe. So I'm going to put it down as it could suck, but it's really not within that wheelhouse. Again, Bob Dylan, let's do a mashup. I'm genuinely impressed by this man, Walter Wolfman Washington. He plays such simple, soothing blues guitar with easy vocals. They're deep and comforting. Plus, the songwriting is on point. I can see myself on a date finding some back alley stage somewhere on the side of the French Quarter and falling into a listen of this guy. That would have me excited and surprised. Genuinely, there's something about him that makes you want to fall in love. And the lack of studio production makes it feel like Tony Bennett, or at the very least, some romantic ballad artist. And that's definitely what I hear when the song Lost Mind comes on. It's serious, let me come over and make dinner for you type vibe. And I think it plays to any occasion for a romantic encounter. Light guitar, poised vocals, feels for days. But is it great? I think it's catchy, but I'm sure that's not a popular sentiment. I do think you have to appreciate both guitar and raw music to understand the beauty and the allure of this song. But if I can be an advocate for anyone that's questioning why I chose to review this song, it's in the vocals. It's like a Barry White layer on John Coltrane. It's just feels and mood and all around talent. I'll give this a half thumbs up just to keep the masses at bay while I bask in its simplicity. And this is a go-to playlist song for specific moments. Like I've already mentioned, play this when cooking for your soulmate. There's a ton of soul, a lot of easy listening. It plays well in the background of enjoying another's company, but can also step to the front and pick out lyrics that can relate and play up the mood. No, I don't think you're gonna put this on a road trip playlist. You're certainly not blasting this at the bars, but I'll be damned if it's not a wedding, reception, marriage proposal, go-to song. And for cultural impact, that's certainly a question. It took me some serious researching to find this gym. But if you look into the man's track record, it's seriously impressive. Studio albums dating back to the 80s. And he even has his own Spotify feature playlist. Clearly the man is talented and has roots with appeal, even if they may only exist in New Orleans. So we've got two and a half thumbs up. Tiebreaker time. Would you play this in front of your parents? Hell yeah. I feel like my dad would immediately download this track on his first generation iPad, go buy roses, conceive of a better dinner than chicken parmesan, and set up a dinner date at that exact moment. And mom would genuinely be impressed and comforted. The parents of any generation or taste would enjoy this track. So yes, at three and a half thumbs up, it is great. Save this for a special occasion or just enjoy the absolute mature vocals and somber guitar. It feels all the way through. And it should be a lot more popular than it currently exists on digital streaming platforms. Lost Mine by Walter Wolfman Washington. Three X's approved, great song. So clearly there's a lot of influence in this city. Jazz, R&B, rock, soul, pop, you name it, they've got it. You can see a lot of different things. You can experience a lot of different things. It's historic. The modern. Nolens, baby. New Orleans, Louisiana. And that's all we've got for 3X is 9. Again, we're on YouTube, Spotify, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I'm Hayes Clement, and we'll see you next time.